So today's speaker is Dr. Stephanie Bonney, who's standing there uh, at, the, at the wall. Um, Dr. Bonney is an, is an assistant professor of surgery in the Division of Trauma and Surgical Critical Care at Rutgers University Medical School in Newark, New Jersey. She practices uh, trauma and critical care surgery at their university hospital in Newark. Um, she is the medical director of the center's hospital-based violence intervention program. Uh, Dr. Bonnie is the, is the surveillance core director of the New Jersey Center for Gun Violence Research at Rutgers University, and she also serves as the co-director of the hospital-based violence intervention work group of the American College of Surgeons Committee on Trauma. She's also involved in many other organizations working to study and reduce violence and injury. And she's also the editor of the, one of the editors of the American Journal of Surgery. So both academic and practical experience coming to us here. Please give a warm welcome to Dr. Bond. So thank you for having me today. Um, it's always exciting to come talk to a group of people who are interested and to be invited to speak about this issue, which is um, very near and dear to my heart. Is so, the phone coming in or no? Oh, oh, sorry. I just forgot to. Yeah. So uh, again, thank you for having me. Uh, so uh, as mentioned, I am a trauma surgeon. That's my clinical practice. So I stay in the hospital four nights a month and a few weeks um, during the month as well where anything and everything that comes to the trauma center that needs emergency surgery um, comes to me and we evaluate people and take them to surgery or um, or try to you know, get them to the hospital and take care of them for whatever they need. So this is sort of my day job and this is a picture of me operating on somebody who had been shot in the abdomen. Um, and so we you know, have to take him directly to surgery and stop all the bleeding and fix whatever we find that's damaged on the inside. So that's really how I got interested in the idea of firearm injury. Um, I actually come come to New Jersey as I, I actually lived here for very long, um, but I grew up outside of Detroit, and then um, I did all of my medical school and training in Chicago, um, where I was working in Cook County and in the emergency room. And we've all heard about um, what's going on in Chicago these days, and then. I did um, some additional training specifically for trauma and ICU care at Washington University in St. Louis. Um, so I was in St. Louis and then I came here actually as a trailing spouse. My husband's job brought us to the New York area and being interested in injury and violence, it seemed like New York was probably the, a good place for me to work. Um, so I'm going to talk today both about guns and violence. And I think that sometimes these two issues get conflated. Um, and we hear a lot in the lay press about gun violence, but they're actually two separate issues that overlap, um, like a Venn diagram. So here we have um, uh, guns. So there's a lot of issues around firearms, and there's a lot of ways that people get injured by firearm. One is some is a person intentionally shooting another person. That's what we think of as gun violence. Um, but there's also suicide, um, and there's child access, and there's also assault that happens with the weapon without shooting it, so things like pistol whipping and stuff, and so we see a lot of that as well in the trauma center. And then there's violence. There's intimate partner violence, there's assaults, there's child abuse, there's all kinds of other intimate, uh, uh, interpersonal injury that is not necessarily perpetrated with a gun. So, you know, people get stabbed, they get beat up with baseball bats. Um, so in the Gun Violence Research Center, which is the Rutgers side of the thing that I, that I do, the, really the research and, and education component of my life, we're, I'm studying guns. But in the hospital side, where I manage the hospital-based violence intervention program, and I, um, I'm working to reduce violence um, in our community, I'm really dealing with all of this as well. And so they overlap when that violence is perpetrated with a gun, but that's not, you know, there's a much larger picture here. So um, this happened last year. So um, many of you, or I, if you, some people have maybe heard my name before, because um, last November the American College of Physicians came out with a position paper saying what steps they thought 
needed um, needed to be done to reduce gun violence, that, that part that overlaps, in the United States. And the National Rifle Association put out a tweet that said somebody should tell um, self-important anti-gun doctors that they should stay in their lane um, and that we're pushing for gun control. And um, that's actually really not true. Um, and I don't think that any doctor that I know is specifically pushing for gun control. Um, but this came out and there was this big bash, backlash from doctors who said, wait a second, our lane is that we take care of these people every day. They come to our house, the house is a hospital, and, and are in really bad shape, and we're taking care of these folks. So, um, you know, I posted a few pictures. So many of my colleagues around the country posted a few pictures. This was one of my tweets um, from the surgery that we had done. Um, and then this is um, another tweet where I had said, um, you know, hey, NRA, my lane is this room where um, this is the room that I have to go when I have to tell someone that their child has died. Um, and I thought that that was a really good sort of, you know, there's a lot of like blood and guts and bloody shoes and scrubs and all of that, but this I thought was a really powerful and poignant picture because I, I feel like I have chairs for a lot of things that I do in my life. Like I have my chair at the dinner table with my family and I have a rocking chair in my kids' room and then I have this chair where I have to go to tell people their kids have died and I thought that that sort of really brought home the poignancy of that. Um, if you're interested, you can follow me on Twitter. I'm at Scrubbed In. Um, and then here are some other um, hashtags if you're on social media um, and you want to follow us. Um, so this is what ensued. You know, doctors were posting all of these pictures of their bloody scrubs and bloody operating room floors and shoes. And this is, um, we all have cell phones full of pictures like this because this is the daily reality of what we see every day in the United States. Um, so what about gun violence in the United States? So what can we say about it? So um, the U.S. has the highest total firearm death rate. It's 10 times higher than um, the average of all other developed countries. Um, so we are you know, really high uh, in terms of the amount of gun violence that we see in the United States each year. Um, our fire, firearm homicide rate is 3.6 per 100,000. Canada is number two with 0.5 per 100,000, so we're about seven times higher than Canada. Um, and we're, that rate is 50 times higher among individuals age 15 to 24 in the United States. So this is a huge problem that's particularly affecting our younger population. Um, we also have the highest firearm suicide rate in the world with 6.3 per 100,000. Um, Finland is number two at 3.3. Um, and we have just an app, we have, so what's interesting about this is that we have an app for non-firearm suicides, if you take out all the fire, all the suicides in the world that are perpetrated with a gun, and you look at just suicide perpetrated by other means, we are exactly average with the rest of the world, but then you add on the gun suicide and it's, and it's much, much higher. So we have the same rate of mental illness, the same rate of depression and the, the causes that perpetrate, um, firearm or that perpetrate suicide, but we have a much higher suicide rate because of the infusion of firearms in the society. So who does gun violence affect? So most prominently it affects children and teens, it affects African American populations, it affects women, and it affects the mentally ill. And I'm going to go through each of these systematically and talk about them. So firearm is the number two cause of death among children in the United States under the age of 18. Um, unintentional injury is the number one, so things like car accidents, drowning, um, uh, and other type of, of accidental injuries or unintentional injuries is number one, um, but firearm injury is number two. American children are 12 times more likely to die by firearm than children in anywhere else in the world. Um, and American children age 15 to 5 to 14, so we take out the really little kids, um, are 17 times more likely to be murdered by a gun than anywhere else in the, the world, 10 times more likely to die by suicide by firearm, and 9 times more likely to die by unintentional firearm injury. So this is a huge problem that specifically affects children. Um, of our, so the, there's, I'm going to talk a little bit about how we parse out the statistics, but um, there are just under 40,000 deaths in 2017 in the United States by firearm, and about um, 2,500 of them are children. So it's still a huge problem um, uh, that's affecting our kids. If you look at the leading causes of death, ages 1 to 19 in the United States, again, unintentional injury is by far the largest leading cause of death. 
um, that suicide, oops, suicide is number two and um, homicide is number three, and a huge portion of those are firearm injury related. Um, uh, African American youth, this is a huge um, problem as well. So um, this typically tends to be a homicide issue. So black youth are 10 times more likely to be murdered with a gun than white youth. Um, and the rate of firearm death for black males, um, 15 to 19 in the um, United States is four times higher than um, the national average for non-black male youth. So again, I mean, here's, so here's everybody else, here's all the other races, and then here's, here's um, African-American teenagers. Um, we also have a domestic violence problem in the United States that is exacerbated by access to weapons in the home. So if you look at um, female homicide victims per 100,000 um, worldwide, here's all the other developed countries, and um, you can see the United States is way off the chart in terms of women who die at the hands of their intimate partner. If you are a woman in the United States age 18 to 24, the single biggest risk to your life is in your home at the hands of your partner. Um, so that kills more women age 18 to 24 than anything else. Um, the other sort of very striking statistic about um, domestic violence is that if you take two homes in the United States where domestic violence is occurring regularly, so and then you put a gun in one of those homes, the risk to the woman's life in that home goes up by 500%. So she's basically five times more likely to die just by putting a weapon. And it has to do with the lethality of means, the, um, the easy access to highly lethal means in sort of moments of of high intensity. Um, we see the same thing with suicide. So most survivors of suicide will tell you that the, the time between when they decided to commit suicide and the time that they attempted was about 30 minutes. So having access, ready access to lethal means makes suicide much more lethal. Um, so again, intimate partner accounts for 15% of all violent crime in the United States, women to age 18 to 24. Um, over 51 women are shot to death by their partners each month, almost two per day um, in the United States. And again, the presence of domestic violence, a uh, gun in the home of domestic violence increases the risk by 500%. The other thing that's really concerning about this, and when we think about the way that we're building legislation and policy around um, domestic violence, is that there are these sort of like red flag laws or domestic um, laws but many of them specifically speak to married partners. Um, and so actually in 2008 and subsequently into, the, um, into this decade, we're seeing a much higher rate of, of domestic violence um, among dating partners and unmarried partners. And so many of these red flag laws, um, they can't, or prosecution for domestic violence, um, the laws are written in such a way that, that the prosecution doesn't happen outside of a married relationship. Basically, if you're dating somebody and they're abusing you, it doesn't count um, for any of the laws that are intended to protect women or their children. Um, and then uh, I want to talk a little bit about mentally ill. So there's all this like talk in the lay press about how um, the, how, you know, taking the hands out, guns out of the hands of those who are mentally ill, and mental illness is what's really driving the gun problem in the United States, and that's actually really not true at all. Um, those who um, have suffered from mental illness are far more likely to become a victim of gun violence than they are to become a perpetrator. Um, and then if you throw suicide on top of that, it makes it remarkably high. So um, about half, again, about half of all suicide deaths are completed with a firearm. And the population level of of guns is um, is associated with um, suicides, especially in children and adolescents. And so, what does that mean? That means that if you take two states and there one one state is more saturated with guns than the other, then the suicide rate is going to be higher in that that um, state. So it's not like individual event specific. It's just the fact that there are more guns like out in the world in one place means that those suicide rate is going to be higher. There's also this really this big misnomer about suicide that um, that says that those who um, commit suicide would find another way. So it doesn't matter that they have guns. Like we shouldn't even be counting them in these numbers because if they um, didn't have a gun, they would just find another way. So that's actually really really not true. So um, the 
the for those who survive a suicide attempt, 85 to 90 percent will never go on to make a second attempt. But the lethality of means for a firearm suicide is much, much higher than by other means. So about 80 percent of all firearm suicide attempts are successful, um, meaning that the person completes the suicide um, with only 25 to 30 percent by other means. So when you consider that you have basically 50 percent of the people who are committing um, uh, suicide by gun uh, would be unsuccessful um, without the firearm, and then 85% of those people would never go on to make a second attempt. You start running the numbers and think, oh, there's 20,000 suicides every year in the United States. We'd have between 8 and 10,000 people a year that would still be alive um, if they didn't have access to a firearm. So that's, um, it, it, I think we can't dismiss that. We can't just say, oh, this doesn't count. We can't be part of the numbers because just doesn't make sense. Um, it actually, the numbers just don't really bear that out. So what does gun violence cost? Like what is it costing us? Um, so we basically it costs uh, $700 per year per American, um, or slightly more. Um, we spend more on gun violence um, than obesity, diabetes, heart disease. We spend almost as much on gun violence as we do on Medicaid, um, all of Medicaid which is uh, really striking um, when you consider the cost of societies. So who pays for it? Um, I mean, the government pays for it, private insurance pays for it, we pay for it as taxpayers. Um, there's about $229 um, billion devoted to gun violence in the United States annually, and that statistic is um, from 2013, so it's actually a little more now. We just don't have more recent numbers. It's almost $13 million per day is spent in the United States on the consequences of gun violence. The San Bernardino shooting alone had $125 million in hospital and direct costs alone. Um, and again, it's a little bit more or less by state, so Wyoming is the highest, because they have high rates of firearm injury and very low population level, so the rate is much higher, and it ends up being about $1,400 per person in the state of Wyoming. Why so much in the hospital? Like, why does this cost so much? So, well, we have the ambulance, we have the ambulance that takes a person there. We have a trauma activation. So when somebody comes to the hospital and they've been a victim of gun violence, there's an entire team from around the hospital that assembles, including a surgeon, an anesthesiologist, an emergency medicine physician, a bunch of residents, the radiologists, the radiology techs, about 10 nurses. So it's a huge team that comes to attend to this individual. And that activation alone, just taking those people from around the hospital and putting them in the emergency room to receive that patient costs um, between three and four thousand dollars, depending on the, the um, person. That's before they even touch the patient. Then there's you know surgery, multiple surgeries, all the IVs, all the medications, all the fluids, the blood. It's not uncommon uh, for me to transfuse somebody between fifty and one hundred units of blood in a single operation. Um, and uh, then there's you know followed by intensive care unit stays. We usually don't operate on these patients just once. We operate on them multiple times. They have to go back to surgery. Um, and I have myself um, had patients who run our hospital bills well into the millions of dollars um, from a single shooting. And there's all the complications, pneumonia, urinary tract infections, um, procedure complications, abscesses, um, and then there's physical therapy, occupational therapy, nutrition, physical medication and rehabilitation, um, uh, creating um, adaptive devices like wheelchairs and other um, adaptations for the patients, adapting their homes, you can't go home to a four-story walk-up if you're in a wheelchair, um, adapting you know, vans and things like that. And then ultimately there is the, the lost cost of you know, time that that individual is taken out of society, that they're not working, that they may never be able to go back to work and may be permanently disabled. And then the costs to their families too, the mental health costs to their families. Maybe this person was a, you know, the primary childcare um, a provider and now they can't provide childcare anymore so that family has to find alternative childcare and there's just like all kinds of consequences that lead to this enormous ripple effect through families and communities when somebody has been shot. So again, all that hospital cost doesn't count the lost income, the lost income to the family, um, lost productivity, missed school, um, all of these things and then the entire cost of the criminal justice system to attend to the event. So here in New Jersey, um, we spend about $3.3 billion per year um, on firearm injury out of our state budget um, and the consequences of firearm injury, and that 
goes to various places, the criminal justice system, the health system mostly, and then of course lost work and things like disability. Um, this is actually a really good um, document that came out of Giffords. They do a lot of really um, great sort of info um, brochures and infographics that really break a lot of this down. And they did this really um, interesting case on, uh, interesting report on the business case in New Jersey um, and how the that gun violence not only affects like all of these direct costs and the, the costs of the individual and our and how we're supporting these individuals, but it actually is bad for business. Um, and obviously, I mean that makes sense, right? You know, it's bad for if your people are being shot every day outside of your liquor store, your liquor store is not going to get a lot of business. So like that's you know there's actually a good business case for that. So how does prevention equal lower cost? Um, so don't we have to pay for the prevention? Well, of course we have to pay for the prevention. Um, but when you look at cost-benefit analysis across all kinds of different gun violence prevention efforts, they're almost always cost-effective. Um, we and part of that is because we use a public health approach to address this, where we, you know, find out who the populations are that are most at risk. We look at the people who are most at risk of having this problem, and we direct our interventions in a targeted way. So we're not just blanketing the whole population with a specific specific intervention. Um, and that actually makes things really um, cost effective. I'm gonna talk, when I talk about violence intervention, I'm gonna talk about social worker costs um, and what we've done in the hospital, but this is all based on data. Also, um, even if it costs more than what, it, what it's costing right now, it's just the right thing to do because you know it's the right thing to do for people. So, um, uh, and I, you know, try to make that argument too. Um, and then I just, I also want to talk about the personal effects. I, I think it's um, a little bit, um, this gets really sort of glossed over a lot, that there are um, definitely effects upon the upon first responders. Um, you know, uh, people, doctors, nurses, um, emergency medicine folks who, um, in the EMTs who are seeing this every day, you definitely, um, it definitely wears on you. And I think that many of us um, feel that stress um, and also we see survivor guilt um, amongst like families or people, friends, people, you know, somebody, um, there's a shooting and three people get shot in a car and two of them survive and one of them dies. The survivor guilt on the two that survived is really profound. Um, and I think we can't just like gloss over that or gloss over the ripple, ripple effects that this has on you. So why do we have such a problem with research on gun violence? I mean, um, there's, this has been in the news a lot lately. Like, why isn't the Center for Disease Control doing research on this problem? Um, and, and what's the story there? How come we can't we can't do good research? Um, so uh, there's not really a lot of very good data. Um, yeah. So let's talk about this first. So in 1996, um, Congress passed something called the Dickey Amendment. It was named after Jay Dickey, who was a um, Republican congressman from Arkansas. And uh, the amendment, the, the actual language of the amendment said that none of the funds that are allocated to the Center for Dis Disease Control and Prevention can be used to advocate for or promote gun control. Now he subsequently has died, but before he died, he walked this back and said he wished he had never done it and it was a huge mistake. Um, and, and that it was interpreted in ways that he did not intend. Um, what ended up happening is the same year that they that this amendment went in, they cut the CDC's budget by $22.7 million, which was the exact amount that they had funded toward gun violence projects in the years prior. So it was no accident what Congress was trying to do. They were basically saying, we don't want any more research on gun violence. Um, so the CDC stopped doing all gun violence research, and in the subsequent years, the, the CDC budget has gone way up, um, but the funding for gun violence has gone down such that in the three years of between 2009 and 2012, only $102,000 of the entire United States budget was advocate, um, um, allocated toward gun violence through the Center for Disease Control. Now there is the National Institutes of Health and the Department of Justice and the Department of Defense who do fund some gun violence research, but the National Institutes of Health actually followed the CDC's lead and for a long time they did absolutely nothing. And only recently in 2015 did they um, fund the first gun violence center for research, um, which is at the University of Michigan. Um, for those of you who might not be familiar with research and budgets and things like that, $102,000 kind of sounds like a lot of money, but that's about enough for me to like hire um, like two summer medical students um, to 
gather some data for me, um, and that's what the entire country had for over the course of three years. I mean, it's basically nothing. Um, and what ended up happening is the way that this was interpreted is that any project that might come to the conclusion that some sort of policy solution or some sort of restriction on firearm ownership might be effective, if that might be the, what you find when you do your study, you're not allowed to do the study. Um, and that's, that's sort of how that was interpreted, and then all funding ceased. And you know, you talk about, okay, so well, now we can just start doing, like let's, you know, we realize that this was a mistake, now we can just start funding gun violence research again. But this was 1996, which means that we are missing almost 25 years of data that was never collected. We don't have any data on what's been happening in the field of gun violence in the last 25 years. We have very poor ideas about who was affected by this problem, who's, who's being injured, what's happening to them, what the, you know, what the associated reasons are that, that this is happening. Very, very little data about it at all. Um, and we also don't have, like, people like me who, um, like, I'm not super young, but uh, I was training for a really long time, so I am kind of young for my career, like, I'm only six years out, and I don't have, like, mentors, you know, I don't have anybody to, like, show me the way, like, how to do good research, because nobody has been doing the research um, for the last 25 years, and there's, like, there's, like, two people, um, and they can't mentor everybody in the country. So it's been really very difficult to, now that we're turning attention and funding for this, it's sort of like, okay, great, but man, we really we need some direction. Um, then I'm just gonna go back to this. So we don't have reliable data, which really hinders our understanding of the problem in general. Um, and so why don't we have good data? Well, we actually have really good data about who dies from gun violence. Those statistics are actually pretty accurate. And the reason is, quite frankly, it's not that hard to count death certificates. Um, and death certificates are pretty accurate, and there's a pretty accurate way of collecting that data. But we have very little information about who gets shot and lives every year. And the reason is because that relies primarily on admin hospital administrative data. And this, gets, this is now getting a little bit into the weeds and a little bit wonky, but I think it's important to understand um, that the way that we collect data about injured individuals is from the bills that hospitals produce when they take care of them. So if I take out your spleen, um, I have two components to the bill that I write afterwards, and I bill your insurance company or bill whoever, and that says, what did I do, splenectomy, and why did I do it, splenic laceration. And then it is up to me, it is optional, if I put why you had a splenic laceration. And that splenic laceration could be because you fell off a ladder, because you were in a car accident, or because you got shot. And we find that these external causes or this additional information, the fidelity of that in the billing records is only about 50%. So only about half of the bills that, that are supposed to have an external cause do. Furthermore, the CDC doesn't collect every hospital piece of data across the entire country. They sample 120 hospitals. So can you think of 120 hospitals, that's two per state, so can you think of two hospitals in New Jersey that are representative of all of the injuries seen in New Jersey? Um, I mean, it's, if you pick Robert Wood in Morristown, it's gonna look like New Jersey has no gun violence at all. Yeah. Um, so, but if you pick Newark and Camden, it's gonna look like terrible. So um, this is a huge problem. Two hospitals for California, for the entire state of California. Think about that. So it's absolutely absurd. So what happened in 2017 is the CDC came out with their margin of error for whiskers, which is their injury data surveillance system. And the margin of error was um, greater than 80%. So what that means in practical terms is that some, the, this, all the centers that disease control can tell us about gun violence in the United States in 2017 is that somewhere between 20,000 and 225,000 people were shot and they can't tell us how many or who. So that's really, really inadequate. Like how can we even begin to design interventions that are directed if we can't even say how many people are being shot or if we can say like, is that is it twenty thousand people in you know in Oklahoma that are you know having accidents out on their ranches with their with their shotguns or is it you know two hundred thousand people in urban centers like how do we even begin to design interventions around this and using a public health strategy so that's a real real problem. Um, 
So, and if you look at research funding by disease, it's really, really awful. So if you're in this gray area, so this is, oh, so, um, so this is the number of people affected, and this is the amount of, of federal funding that's allocated to the problem. So if you're in the gray area, you're considered proportionate. If you're about right on the line is a proportionate amount of funding. So heart disease is right there. That's a lot of people. Cancer is right there, too. That's a lot of people. Gets a lot of funding, as it should. HIV actually doesn't affect so many people anymore, um, but it still gets a ton of funding. Uh, gun violence is all the way down here. It's affecting a lot of people and getting the most and this is actually not just true for gun violence, but it's actually true for all injury. So this, um, you know, motor vehicle collisions and all kinds of injury and trauma. So um, the, we just actually, out of New York, just published a study last month um, that says that essentially 40% of the United States population will visit a trauma center for an injury at some point in their life, um, but only 2% of the NIH budget is, um, is dedicated toward injury, injury in general. So it's, it's really a problem. So why is research important? Um, and how, what are we going to do about it? So I love to speak to, to motor vehicles as an incredible success story over the last century. So if you look at the annual deaths per billion miles traveled in the United States, um, there were lots of people dying in motor vehicle collisions. Um, um, through, you know, most of the last century. And I mean, I even remember growing up as a kid, I grew up in the 80s, and I remember it's like if you heard that cousin so-and-so was in, was in a car accident, everybody sort of got hushed and was like, oh, you know. Um, because it was like still kind of almost a death sentence. And it's not that way anymore. And part of the reason is because we took a public health, multifaceted, multidisciplinary approach to this problem. We didn't take away anyone's car, but we made cars safer. We made the environment that cars um, that surround cars safer. We enacted policy solutions, things like graduated driver's licensing, and um, and other kinds of you know public uh, public policy solutions. And we also um, did advocacy, like. Mothers Against Drunk Driving is a huge reason why this happened, right? Like, it's not socially acceptable to drink and drive anymore the way it was back in the 50s and the 60s. So um, all of these things had a piece of this, right? So it wasn't one single intervention that was like the golden um, thing that happened, but all of these various interventions worked. We have engineering solutions now, the non-collapsible um, passenger compartments in cars, the airbags. Um, and quite frankly, um, things like banking roads and, and speed limits and all of those things. So it was a lot, a lot, a lot of stuff. And all those interventions were based on the data that we had, you know, where people were getting into accidents and who was getting into accidents and why and what were the circumstances surrounding it. So if we say that gun violence is a public health problem, so what does that exactly mean? If I said, so we get that a lot, right? It's like a, in a lot of rhetoric, oh, this is a public health problem, we need to address it as a public health problem. But what does that mean? Like if we all um, you know, sat in a conference room and got out our pads of paper and said, today we're going to address gun violence as a public health problem, what would that mean that we're actually doing? Well, we would be using the public health approach to disease prevention, which is a well-studied, well, -studied, well um, you know, scientifically rigorous approach to preventing disease. And it involves primary prevention, secondary prevention, and tertiary prevention. So primary prevention means preventing the problem from ever happening to begin with, preventing the gun from ever going on. Secondary prevention is early detection and treatment. So, you know, um, how do we get somebody um, to a trauma center quickly, things like that. And then tertiary prevention is about softening the disease impact. How do we, um, you know, once somebody has the disease of gun violence, how do we prevent it from being spread, it, spread um, to the people around them? Or how do we prevent it from um, affecting the individual? So it's, it can be a little bit, you know, this, this model um, is like, it's sort of very intuitive when we talk about like, like Zika virus, right? Like, well, how do you prevent it? Okay, mosquito spray, and you know, how, how do you do secondary prevention? Well, you figure out how to move somebody has Zika really early, and then tertiary prevention is about getting them medications as soon as possible. It's a little bit, you have to think a little bit harder about it when you're talking about, um, about injury issues, but it does work, um, and it's actually really well described. Um, the other, and then, yeah, so we talked about, um, I just want to make this other point about gun violence spreading like a disease to populations. 
So there's actually some really interesting data out of New York um, that was done a few years ago around the population model of violence that basically says when you have one person that's affected by violence, all of their contacts become um, people in their family, their friends, their social contacts all become affected by violence. And once that disease of violence meets those people, then they're affected as well. Um, and it's both victims and perpetrators. So um, one of the really more, more um, sort of compelling statistics about the way that this works in urban environments is that by being connected to either a victim or a perpetrator of violence, you are far more likely to become a victim. So it's not just victims um, spreading to victims, it's victims and perpetrators. And that victim-perpetrator relationship um, in communities afflicted by violence is really complicated, but it does follow this sort of social pattern. Um, if you look at um, Newark, again, I go back to Newark because that's you know, my space and that's what I know. Um, about 45% of all of the gun violence in Newark um, is, is perpetrated to 4% of the population and they all know each other. They're all, they're all in the same community. So it definitely has this disease type impact. So again, one intervention is not going to solve all the problems. So just like how we you know, meet seatbelts and, and airbags and bank to curves and have other things from driving, we're not going to do, we need to do that for guns. So there's lots of options, right? Trigger locks, smart guns, safety mechanisms, violence intervention programs that reduce violence in communities, gun safety education programs, educating people about why firearm safety is important. Um, some of it will be policy and laws, and then things like mental health suicide um, programs and advocacy to say, like, hey, this is a problem. So again, this public health approach to injury prevention involves de defining the problem, so knowing who's affected, and I just talked to you about the CDC and why we're really terrible at doing that right now, identifying the causes, developing and testing interventions, so looking at you know, what's causing this happen in this population, and then, hey, here's a potential intervention. Let's design one, let's test it, see if it works, and if it does work, then we have to disseminate and adapt those solutions. So at Rutgers, um, we, so in the absence of federal funding, um, so we talked about how there's this federal funding problem, um, two states have stepped up and created state-based centers to address gun violence. California, three years ago, and New Jersey last year. So this was um, a, a legislation enacted by the governor um, to create a budget for a gun violence research center. We have annual funding. It was the, the grant was given to Rutgers. There were multiple applicants and um, we got the, the grant. Um, it's, we started um, being funded in November of 2018. It's a cooperative between the Department of Health, the Attorney General's Office, the various um, legislatures. And then um, we basically are here to do research and make recommendations to the state government about um, evidence-based policy solutions and health solutions to gun violence. So this is a little bit about us. This is just like how we're set up. So you can see we've got the health science, Rutgers Newer, the School of Public Health, Rutgers Camden. Here's the center. The co-directors are Bernadette and Mike. Um, and then we have these various advisory boards, including the scientific advisory board, a community advisory board, um, and some administrative support. And then um, there's an outreach core, a surveillance core, which is me research core and a training and education core. And there's no accident here that, so here's a surveillance core, so my job in all of this is to collect data from the health department, from the criminal justice system, and merge it into reports about exact, like, like to solve that problem, how many people are being shot that live every year. And, you know, the national government can tell us, but how can we do that here in New Jersey? Identifying risk factors and producing reports. The research course, core supports investigators who use that data to develop interventions. The education board develops curriculum in public education and creates literature around things like firearm safety and um, education. And then the dissemination board does public mes messaging and investigates public opinion about um, the, the causes of gun violence in New Jersey. And it's not an accident that, that you know, surveillance, research, education, and dissemination exactly follow that public health approach that we know works. And this is very intentional. This is the graph about what I was telling you about, about how the CDC is um, getting uh, more unreliable. So this is the coefficient of uncertainty. So um, you know, this is the number of people that the CDC says are being um, shot every year. And this is like 
you know, they would like so in uh, 2004, for example, you know, they thought it was around 70,000, but it was somewhere between 30 and 100,000. And then, you know, here we are in 2017, where they think it's over 100,000, but it's somewhere between 20 and 225, and they don't know. So again, surveillance capitalizes on the existing strengths that we have. So the health department has a lot of data. The criminal justice system has a lot of data. The, the schools have a lot of data. There's all this data about people. It's all de-identified. It's all private. But we can merge it together and get really like a much better picture of what, what's happening um, and how we can potentially develop interventions. So that's that's my charge essentially as a researcher. And we produce things like this. This is. Um, um, a project that I did with one of our students where we talked about the demographics of firearm injury recidivism. So we looked at who are the people in Newark who get shot twice. Um, so it's about 20%. So if you're sitting in my emergency room in Newark with a gunshot wound, uh, one in five of, of those folks that come in have been in my emergency room shot before. Um, so who are the people that, that are that one in five that get shot twice? And is there something that we can do the a way to identify them the first time around so that we can provide them with an intervention so that they don't get shot the second time. Um, and so that's what this poster was about. So now I'm going to move away. So I'm back to our Venn diagram. I've talked a lot about this side of it, right, the gun side. And so now I'm going to talk about the violence side and what we're doing about violence. So uh, this year, New Jersey Assembly passed a series of bills, 481 to 4806. They were introduced in December by the Green Bill. This is um, a little bit old, but out of committee and actually signed now. Um, and here's what they look like. So they established the New Jersey Violence Intervention Program to fund violence reduction initiatives. So now we're over on the other side of the Venn diagram where we're talking about gun violence, but we're also talking about all violence. So things like domestic violence, assaults, um, stabbings, all the other kinds of things that we see in the trauma center. In University Hospital, we see about 3,500 trauma admissions per year, so about 10 per day. Um, and approximately 40% of that is interpersonal violence, meaning we see about somewhere between 12 and 1,400 people who are um, violently injured. And that's actually much more because these are the number of people who are injured badly enough to rise to the attention of a trauma surgeon. It doesn't count everybody who shows up to the emergency room with like a blowout fracture of their eye or something that they have punched. Um, we see about five to six hundred gunshot wounds per year, so about one to two per day. Um, and we, you know, obviously have a disproportionately affect um, young men and minorities. This is a study that was done by my boss back in 2013, but our demographics are roughly the same. So, you know, our firearm injury patients are predominantly young, um, almost half are between the ages of 20 and 29. We actually have very few kids in Newark um, for whatever reason, and we're not totally sure why, but um, it's not a problem that seems to affect New York the way it does in other urban places. Here's a map. You can see here's our hospital. The majority of our patients come from the central ward, south ward, and west wards of New York. Um, we also get quite a few patients from um, Irvington and East Orange. And actually, in the past few years, there's been an increasing gentrification of specifically the Ironbound and um, uh, downtown areas of Newark. Um, and housing is becoming unaffordable, and we're finding that a lot of um, a lot of uh, impoverished. Um, communities are moving out of the city, um, specifically into Irvington, East Orange, and Hillside, and that those have become increasing nidices of violence um, since that's starting to happen. Um, so if we talk about violence now as a public health issue, we want to think about violence. We, we know who's affected, so we sort of have the surveillance piece down, but how can we develop interventions to address that population? And if we recognize that violence is a public health issue, that means that we can modify root causes for violence. Um, there's multiple factors that contribute to violence that go from the individual to interpersonal to organizational to community to policy. Um, and we try to work in the hospital to address all of these. So we in the hospital developed a program that's going to be supported by these bills um, that went through the uh, New Jersey legislature to address violence in the hospital. So what happens is um, we use a case management based model. So we've hired individuals from the community that are credible messengers to our violently injured victims, okay? So this is a really, really important component to this model. Um, and it's, um, 
So we started, we started based on something called a teachable moment in the hospital. Um, this teachable moment idea goes way back to the 70s to something we borrowed actually from the cardiac literature, which is I can go out and tell somebody in the community that um, if they're overweight and they smoke and they don't exercise and they have high cholesterol, that they're at very high risk of having a heart attack. Um, but it's always like after the quadruple bypass surgery when somebody's laying in the hospital bed that they're ready to quit smoking and start eating better and start exercising. So we have the same idea when it comes to violence. I could go out into um, you know, anywhere and say, look, if you are, you know, that didn't finish school, don't have a job, or engaging in um, you know, um, illegal substance trade or something like that, you're at very high risk of becoming a, a victim of gun violence. But it's not until, or violence in general, um, but it's not until somebody's laying in the hospital having been assaulted or shot or stabbed that they're willing to hear like, hey, that's th these are factors about my life that I can modify to make myself less at risk for what's happening again. So it's the exact same model that we use with heart disease, but we use it with violence. And so we, but the problem is, is that I'm not the best messenger, right? So if I go to our victims of violence in Newark and I go to their bedside, looking as I do, and say, hey, you should really think about going back to school and getting a job, they're going to look at me and say, what do you know about my life, doctor? I mean, you, you don't look like me, you don't know anything about me, you don't know anything about my community. So the messenger really has to be somebody from the community. So that's really, really important. So we lean a lot on our, on our partnerships with our community-based organizations, and we hire folks to come work in the hospital that are non-traditional hospital workers. So these are folks who frequently had involvement in the criminal justice system, maybe have been a victim of violence themselves, or um, maybe had gang involvement at one time in their life, who are not doing this anymore, who come to that and, and give that message, like, hey, you really need to think about doing this, otherwise you're at very high risk of becoming a victim again. So we, um, this is sort of what that looks like schematically. So somebody gets the trauma care by the doctors and then the case managers come to their bedside and if they're deemed to be a high risk uh, individual, they are enrolled in our intervention program. And there's our teachable moment. So what does that mean? That means that these individuals really serve as mentors to our victims of violence and they help them work through many of the um, structural barriers that we find in urban or um, urban environments, impoverished environments, and otherwise um, environments that are disadvantaged in some way. So what they're what they're doing every day is they're like getting to know the patients. You know, hey, what are your goals? What do you want to do with your life? Tell me about your family. Tell me what you need right now to be safe. They help them with housing. They help with um, getting victims of crime compensation paperwork through the system. They help with applications to school, GED programs, going to job fairs, um, uh, developing, you know, getting them involved in community activities or engaged with community-based organizations. And, um, and they really help, but it's not just like, hey, you should go down uh, and see these, get, get some mental health services from the, this clinic down in, in, in the South Ward. It's, hey, this is a good clinic for the mental health services that you need for your PTSD because you just got shot. Let me take you there. Let me take you and fill out the paperwork with you and I'm gonna sit there in the waiting room with you and I'm gonna be there when you come out and we're gonna go get lunch and talk about how it goes. So it's very, very much a really engaged sort of handful, we call it a warm handoff, to, to community-based organizations. And it's part of actually a well-described um, model, three-legged three model of how we address urban gun violence. Um, this is some data from Gifford. So there's group violence intervention, which is commonly called ceasefire. This is really an enforcement-based, um, law enforcement-based um, thing where um, the law enforcement will get like rival gangs into a room together to like hash shit out in a safe space. Um, care violence is basically the same idea, this handhold to community-based organizations, but it's done with, um, it's done like out in the community with people who have sort of risen to the top as, as being folks who might be at risk. And then hospital-based intervention, which is exactly what I just described. And so in many communities are using this three-legged approach. And where this approach is done well across all three domains, we see drastic reductions in gun violence in these communities. New York has been actually a remarkable success story for this. Um, 
can say something else about the program. Oh, so the outcomes. So uh, we've, we've had our program in uh, Newark has been up and running for about two years. We've enrolled over 200 um, victims of violence. Uh, we have about an 80% engagement rate, so about 80% of the people who sign up actually show up to at least one appointment, um, which is remarkable. I mean, I can't even get, I can't even get, like, I have a 40% return rate for people to come take down colostomies. So, I mean, it's like really, remarkable and we have very very poor follow-up in general in this population but the fact that 80 percent of them engage is like off the charts um so we're really pleased with that we've had about 20 um we, we never really um discharge anybody from the program we're there as long as they need us and so we have some folks that got engaged with the program you know two years ago right when we started that are still with their case manager and they're still working through stuff and other people you know um it takes maybe six months and they um they go get a GED, get a job find a, a safer apartment and they're sort of on their feet and we just sort of back away and we call that graduating um so we've had about 20 program graduates um and at least um uh, Sixty percent of our patients have, have had at least one positive um, intermediate outcome. So they've either gone back to school, gotten a job, gotten the first job, um, gotten engaged with the mental health system, gotten BCCO and, and housing and relocation. So we consider all of that to be positive outcomes, and um, it's sixty percent mostly because you know we still have like thirty patients that have just been um, consented in the last you know, three months and we wouldn't expect those people to reach those outcomes yet anyway. So um, that's, you know, what we're doing. Um, the program is extremely low cost um, and such that if we prevent um, two, so two recidivists, but when I talked about people being shot and then getting shot again, if we prevent two of those per year from coming to University Hospital, um, the program has paid for itself. So it's remarkably cost effective to the hospital to be engaged in prevention. Um, and that's it. I'm happy to answer questions. I'd love to hear everyone's thoughts. <laughs> Thank you so much. Yeah, of course. This, course. this has been fabulous. I, this is an issue that I thought I knew a fair amount about. <laughs> it's an issue that I cared about, that I like, donated to. And yet, I think I learned so much more than I thought I was expecting to learn uh, okay. yeah, from yeah. this. I mean, this is... <laughs> I say this at the beginning of uh, each of our forums. I say that, you know, we, you know, we turn our attention to, um, you know, application of reason, lessons of history, and our own personal experience to find meaning in life, and I really think you've embodied that. <laughs> I, I'm really, you know, the number of myths you've been able to, to, uh, you know, explode here, and the amount of data you've brought to this, even though the data is lacking, you know, yeah. really doing a wonderful job. And I, you clearly found meaning of life from from these, from your experiences and, and what you've learned from the data. So, yeah, definitely wonderful. Um, so I'm going to bring the mic around, um, and in addition to. Um, this being amplification, which is hopefully improved from our previous setup. Um, it also treated as the talking stick. I want to make sure that only the person who has the talking stick is talking. Um, I will try and get around to everyone. Um, I will promise to get around to everyone once. I'm going to make sure that everybody has had a question and comment once before I go around a second time. And um, anything else you want me to say? Oh, just. I mean, we're all still experimenting with this microphone, but it's good to treat it like a flashlight right into your mouth, um, <laughs> rather than holding it like this, because you don't get as much pickup. You hold it like this, you don't pick up. Okay? All right. So, I'm going around. And the first hand I see, we go here with her. I understand the data is hard to come by. Yeah, right. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but, uh, and also, uh, you didn't mention the big elephant in the room, the NRA, which has a clout on any kind of change in the political sphere. Uh, but uh, uh, my question is, uh, uh, can you set up a percentage between uh, the impact of mass shootings and individual shootings? Uh, is there a significant percentage of the overall picture or nothing? No, it's um, mass shootings are less than one percent. 
of all deaths, um, and less than you know 0.1 percent of all injuries in the United States. So they get a lot of press because it's really you know it's dramatic when it happens and and terrible, of course. But um, it's the and I think this is a lot to what like when the doctors sort of were like with the bloody scrubs on Twitter, we're like, hey, yeah, like, yes, this is tragic, 100%. However, we're seeing this every single day and it's not making the news. Um, you know, I mean, I had a, a case a few months ago in Newark where four high school girls got shot and one of them died and it didn't even make NJ.com. So it's like, you know, it, it's, you know, we just, it's happening all the time. But mass shootings is considered two or three. Uh, four or more. Four or more. Four or more is a mass shooting. So actually a lot of mass shootings don't make the news because it's, it, the, you know, the most common reason to have a mass shooting is a domestic, is an issue of domestic, somebody comes and kills their whole family. That's, that's the most common reason for having domestic, for having a mass shooting. Um, and but the ones that make the press are like you know the WalMarts and the schools and the, the you know, Las Vegas and things like that. So, yeah. As a follow-up to that, uh, what you always see Congress respond with is uh, hopes and prayers, and uh, then uh, we have to do something about mental health, right? Because I guess the premise is if we could spot these mass shooters before they become mass shooters we could stop them from being mass shooters, but it sounds like that wouldn't even make a very significant impact. I mean, there's, I, I don't know where the data falls out on this. Um, I think, you know, in my, my experience and my opinion is that, you know, yes, like arming, arming folks with military style weapons um, creates an opportunity that might not otherwise exist without the weapon, um, but, yeah, I mean, the I, I, it, it's a it's a really hard. Thing. I mean, everything that we do, we do within the within the context of the Second Amendment. I mean, we are we have a constitutional right to bear arms in this country, but how does that mean and how is that interpreted? Um, I think is really highly variable and is the issue at play here, right? Um, when, especially when we start talking about the, the National Rifle Association and things like that. When you're taking a public health approach, you believe that um, that you can affect change and you can lessen death and disability by you know applying a multidisciplinary multifaceted approach that doesn't necessarily mean taking the vector away completely right so like the point i made about cars like we didn't take cars away but we made deaths from motor vehicles go down so there are ways to do it um but you know some of those are going to be policy-based solutions and that you know policy at least federal policy relies on congress um, so it's definitely something that needs to be addressed and needs to be to be explored um, as one facet of the public health approach. Because you know certainly public health is is also policy driven. I mean there there's no question that that's part of the part of the of approach. So um, but yeah I um, as far as you know pointing to mental health. I mean again I think that that's. It, I, I feel like that's sort of a dangerous road to walk down a little bit because it's like, so how do you identify um, who can and cannot have a weapon then without stepping on Second Amendment rights? And then also, I feel like that creates the potential to label people as other, um, which really concerns me a lot. And quite frankly, I, I have concerns about policy-based approaches toward, um, toward firearm ownership um, and the criminalizing of gun ownership. Because I think, you know, we're so saturated in this country. It's not like we're gonna have a huge buyback where everybody's gonna come and give a, you know, put their guns into a dumpster and lock them down like they did in Australia. But um, if by criminalizing the ownership of a weapon, I feel like there's the opportunity for unequitable enforcement of those policies. And specifically, because I work with a vulnerable population in New York, and I work with an, um, a population where, for example, um, the, the war on drugs has had a profound effect on that community, um, and criminalizing, for example, marijuana possession, and I see the, the unequitable distribution of the enforcement of marijuana possession between my patients that come from New York and my patients that come from the suburbs. 
So I also worry about you know, how we criminalize weapons that is going to disproportionately affect communities of color in particular. I know that I feel like now I just really opened the Pandora's box. Now we just audience. I don't know. I, uh, I have a couple of questions, but uh, it was a very good talk. Now, most of this information that I have uh, on this subject comes from uh, uh, misinformation or propaganda from our government and politicians, mostly. And that, but this is the first time I've really heard any real evidence in this regard to this issue. So, uh, my, my question, I guess, if I have one, is uh, how do you get out? more to, uh, to, to, to more of the, of the public to just discount this, uh, what we have now, which is just a misinformation. I mean, I think things like this are helpful. I mean, for what it's worth, I'm not sure that, you know, going on TV and giving a talk like this is going to be as productive as, you know, quite frankly, going out and talking to folks. And, but it works with smoking. You know, it works with smoking. Right. I mean, but it took years. It took 50 years, really, for smoking. It's still a problem. So it's... Um, I don't know. I don't know what the answer is. I mean, we're publishing, we're doing what we can, we're sort of all screaming at the top of our lungs about this. Um, but it's, it's very difficult. It's a, it is a huge, heated topic. Um, and, it, and it actually, like, it doesn't have to be. It's just, um, I think in a polarized world that we live in right now, it's become a heated and polarized topic. And actually, there's a lot of common ground um, it's just that people are so unwilling to look for the common ground um, that it, it becomes, you know, a problem. And then, you know, you infuse money and power into the whole situation and it creates a situation that's untenable. Okay, so my, my question is about the cost of gun mm -hmm. violence and that they seem to have some great scientific work on health care costs and law enforcement costs. I know um, I have a house in Jackson and they just had a referendum to hire all these armed guards in, the, in every school and to retrofit architecturally schools, courthouses, hotels, all these other public buildings to try to do some sort of gun violence prevention avenues those ways. And that, that how can we measure like that cost of gun violence when they're talking about all this you know, really changing a building like you would for fire prevention, now you also have to have a, a shooter prevention plan in every new public structure, or even old, retrofitting old public structures for that sort of prevention. Yeah, I mean, that's really, I mean, so you can count the costs of like, what is it, you know, what the locks cost and what are things like that, but also like, what are the human costs to that? So like, you know, one huge interest, one huge thing that the Gun Violence Research Center is interested in is what are the psychological costs to children of having to go through these drills in school? Um, and that's something that we're really interested in studying is like, is this the right way to go about this with our kids? And also, you know, just, Again, you can count the cost of, of a lock, and as we start doing these things, like retrofitting these buildings, I'm sure in, some, in a few years somebody will come out with a study where they, you know, basically estimate the cost of doing that. But also, like, you know, for example, I now have to like email. I have to send like two separate emails, 48 hours apart, plus present my identification in order to like get my child from his elementary school. So that like create some, we live in Westfield where the shooter showed up to the school last year, so they like, there's like this huge plan. Um, but like there's time and opportunity and, and, and like cost to that too. Like if I'm sending two emails to the school, I'm not in the operating room, like I'm not, it's not productive. So, you know, that's like where, where, where cost gets sort of really gray, but there are costs that aren't being caught. And so like when I talk about things like, um, I had that slide up about like first responder and, and survivor guilt and first responder stress. Like nobody is is counting the costs that the emergency room medicines spend on like their therapists, which they have to go to because they see horrible things and they have to debrief that somehow. But, like nobody's saying like, oh, the emergency medicine physician needs, or you know, or uh, um, nurse needs to go talk to somebody and they're spending ten thousand dollars a year on therapy for their to just to be able to do their job. Like nobody's counting them, those kinds of things. 
happens. So I mean, the, the, the ballooning costs and, and the ripple effect is just so hard to measure. Um, I mean, we measure what we can, but we know that it's, it's much more in some amount. Yeah. Um, my my father-in-law was on the police reserves, and when he passed away, my husband got his gun, the handgun, mm -hmm. and he stored it in the, the, the china closet. Mm -hmm. Now my son, who was a toddler, was crawling around, and he opens the drawer, and he's playing with his gun, and I, uh, and I told my husband, either the gun's going or you're going. <laughs> All right? So, uh, what, you know, shouldn't there be some kind of um, how do you prevent these? It's common sense. You don't leave a loaded gun when you got a toddler walking around. Correct. So um, this is something that we talk about a lot. Um, so the proper way, so it's tell all your friends, tell your friends' friends, tell your family, the proper way to store a firearm in your home is unloaded and locked with the ammunition locked in a separate cabinet that has a separate key or a separate keypad. Um, that is the proper way to store a weapon, but most people don't want to do it because they feel like they, you know, they want a loaded gun in their bedside drawer because they they have it because they're concerned about like a break-in or something like that. Also, uh, science and facts: um, if you own a weapon and you have a weapon in your house, um, you are far more likely to die at the hands of that weapon than you are to ever use it toward an intruder, like by a factor of greater. Than so it's um, you know it's it's dangerous to have to have a weapon in the home. If you're going to have a weapon in the home, it should absolutely be stored properly. It should be a calculated risk. You should know that it's a risk. Um, and we hear stories all the time about um, children who you know they had the smart gun, they had the keypad, everything was locked. I mean, kids are smart. You know, they know how to get to things. They know how to do things. Um, I would say you know if you are the inheritor of a weapon. Um, this was like recently an issue in my own family. Um, you can, you know, your choices are you can buy a gun safe and keep, keep the weapon, or you can turn it into your local police department and they're happy to take it off your hands and, and dispose of it properly. So. Japan, I read, I think about a year ago, which isn't blessed with the Second Amendment, had about 12 deaths in their entire population for the year of 130 million people, which is astounding. Uh, it's really something. Uh, I wonder if things will change when white, middle, and upper classes start to get shot on the streets the way they do in places in black areas. It seems to be an acceptable thing. And a point to the opioid uh, situation which started to hit white people and all of a sudden you get the go former governor of New Jersey saying oh this is something we have to come together about and, uh, and handle uh, this is terrible uh, of course 20 years ago when it hit black communities the answer was J my, uh, my, my actual question is in your profession of saving people's lives from gunshots and everything. Compared to say 20 years ago, do you know if there are, what the numbers are in terms of people surviving uh, uh, gunshots from from 10, 15, 20? Are more people surviving, or is the lethalness of the weapon, you know, uh, abrogating that? Yeah. So thank you for your comments, and that's a great question. Um, so I can't speak to nationally, but in Newark, um, the mortality rate has gone up. Um, and that it, while the mortality rate from all other causes of trauma has gone down, so we in the trauma community have had remarkable, made remarkable like successes to, um, you know, blood transfusions. The way that we transfuse blood is different than it used to be. Um, we use like a different component of aggregates and blood products. Um, we have really interesting technology now where like if you come in and your pelvis is broken I can like put a balloon up your aorta and stop the bleeding really fast whereas that, that used to be like a completely lethal injury. So the lethality and our mortality of trauma has gone down remarkably however the mortality from gunshot wounds has gone up. 
um, and that we do specifically attribute to two factors. One is um, we have more people who are shot more than once. Um, so the most I've ever seen is 26 um, times that somebody was shot, um, and he survived, actually. He, um, I mean, he needed a lot of surgery, but we, um, you know, he survived. And um, the other is um, that the, the weapons are higher velocity and um, more penetrable now. So hollow point bullets are technically um, illegal, but we do see a lot of hollow point bullets. Almost all the bullets that I take out of people are hollow points. Um, and so for those of you who don't know, um, you know, a bullet is shaped like this, and a hollow point is meant to explode on impact so that it's dull, so that it tumbles through the tissues and causes more damage. Um, and they're actually illegal in hunting, and they're, they're illegal, but I mean, that's almost everything that I see, um, versus a bullet that just goes through and lacerates the tissues, which is much easier to fix. Um, and then when we start talking about things like high-capacity weapons, um, the velocity of those is really remarkable. And I actually, um, I actually, I, I don't know the citation offhand, but CBS News did something um, a while ago, um, like 60 Minutes or one of those shows, um, where there's a there's a ballistics lab in Texas, and they like shot a gel with um, that mimics human human tissue with a um, handgun, and then they shot it with an AR-15, and they showed the damage. Um, I mean, just from like the perspective of a sort of person and mother, um, the only sort of like consolation that I take on these like mass shootings with the AR-15s is that the people just they don't suffer very long. I mean, when I think about the kids in Sandy Hook, that's usually what I think is, oh, they didn't know what was happening, and it was quick. Thank you. Yeah. I know. Yeah. Thank you for a really informative talk. Um, my question is, what can we, out here in the birds, help with? You, know, <laughs> um, you cited Mothers Against Drunk Driving as helping with, um, you know, traffic problems. Uh, Mothers Against Gun Violence exists. I know Bloomberg has put a lot of money into this and research it. What can we do? So I think that, um, you know, first of all, just like making this a conversation um, in your communities, I think is really important. And making it, um, saying things like, um, I'm a safe space. Like if you have an adolescent or you have a person who you feel like might be depressed and you know they have a gun in the home, can I take your gun for a while? Um, there's a really good public service announcement in Utah a while ago where there's like a guy at a gun range and he's shooting and he stops and he looks at the, the camera and he says, you know, a few months ago I was going through a really rough time, my wife died, my, I was out of a job, um, and my friends came and took my guns away and I think it saved my life. Um, and like that was a great message, and actually they found that the that in the um, ranges where they showed they showed them at gun ranges, they showed this commercial, and then the number of suicides in those communities went down in the ensuing year. So, you know, making the normalization of saying like it's okay that you have a weapon, it's just important that it's it's safe, that it we're responsible about it. It is freedom with responsibility. And, um, and we, we can help and we can talk about this as a community and we don't have, this doesn't have to be whispered discussions in corners. You can ask before you send your children or your grandchildren on a play date, do you have a gun in the home? Um, how do you store it? Is it stored properly? If it's not stored properly, why don't you guys come to our house to play instead? You know, because you are concerned about your child, find, you know, the kids are always going to find it. There's a really interesting study, a really, um, it was done back in the 90s actually. Um, they took, it was one of these like Dateline or one of these um, news magazine shows and they took a bunch of boys, um, like late elementary school age boys, like 9, 10, 11 year old boys with their mothers. They had them sit through a like what do you do if you find a gun, gun safety talk and then they took the mothers into a room behind a one way mirror and they had a sham gun hidden in a playroom with the boys and it took them less than 10 minutes to find and fire the gun. Immediately following a gun safety presentation. <laughs> so you cannot count on children to be responsible for their own safety. You can't say, hey, I mean, you can say, hey, if you ever see a gun, run. Okay, sure. But that's, that's not enough. You know, it has to be incumbent upon the adults in the situation to make sure that we're managing this. So making it a conversation, doing those kinds of things. 
I think Moms Demand is, you know, they're doing really good work. But vote, you know, vote with this issue in mind. I mean, I think that these are things that are important. Could you explain in a little bit of detail what smart guns really are, what they can do, and why in places we're not using them? So, yeah. Um, so smart gun technology works in a couple of different ways. Um, it's essentially a trigger lock. Um, and there are several different iterations of it. Some of it is, a, is fingerprint technology, so the, the gun will only shoot if it recognizes the fingerprint of the shooter. Um, some of it is wristband technology, so it will, the gun will only shoot within like a foot of a wristband, so the, the only the, the shooter, the intended um, shooter can have the wristband on. Um, and then some of it has to do with um, locks, um, and like the way that the safes themselves work and the locks work. Um, I, I don't know what the, the bear, I mean, retrofitting all, um, you know, 300 million guns on the street in the United States to that technology would be, I think, prohibitively expensive as part of the problem. So. Oh, another quick fact. I didn't say this one. There, yeah, there are more guns than there are people in the United States, and um, but there's only uh, about uh, less than 20% of all households own firearms. But the average number of guns in a fire own, owning fire um, owning household is 11. College campuses active in discussing this problem? Yeah, so Rutgers definitely is. I mean, that's part of the Gun Violence Research Center. There is a Students Demand Action chapter at Rutgers as well. Um, what's that? Cross the country? Uh, yeah, I mean, I think that there is there is more and more talk about this. A lot of the um, concern around it um, came a few years ago with campus carry. So, I mean, I would argue that, you know, just common sense and empirical data would suggest that. Um, that college campuses are not good places to have guns. I mean, there's just a lot of people in close proximity to each other. It's a stressful time of life. You know, the adolescent brain is not fully developed, even though they're adults at 18. You know, that the adolescent brain is not fully developed until the early 20s. So for a lot of reasons, I think it's probably just not that good of an idea. And, and to my own particular world, medical schools are really terrible places to have guns because they're often connected to hospitals and I can't think of a more stressful thing in the world than going through medical school. So it's like not the time to have easy access to faithful means. Okay. So, okay. Yeah. so I'm, I'm going to try and wrap this up. I'm going to take maybe one or two more questions. So if you have something for me, let me know. I also left a pile of my business cards. Um, so if anybody wants to, has questions after this and wants to email me or if there's other forums like this that um, are looking for speakers. Um, I'd be happy to connect um, anybody with the Gun Violence Research Center or come speak as well. So. Hi. Hi. <laughs> Hi. Hi. Um, this is a question about you said 10 to 20 units of blood, right? You know, somebody bleeding out, you're working on that. Um, this is nothing to do specifically with the gun violence, but. I'm all naked. I cannot donate blood anymore because I was in a place 20 something, 30 something years ago. She knows. She knows where I'm going. Yeah. Yeah. I know. I went on a cruise okay. that stopped one day in Costa Rica, and I'm like forbidden from giving blood ever again. Are they doing any research? Because that's you know, oh, negative. That's like gold. And, you know, you can't type something fast enough. Do yeah. No, we don't type them. They just get blood. They get. Okay. We deal yeah. with it. Yeah, and we deal with it on the back end. Um, yeah, we have something called massive transfusion protocol, which is um, we can start um, what's called NTP, mm -hmm. and the blood bank sends us, um, they basically send us 10 units at a time, mm -hmm. and it's not uncommon, like I said, for us to go through, you know, 8, 10 buckets um, yeah. of blood. Yeah, they, they come in buckets, so we call them buckets, but um, yeah, I don't, that's, that's a really, I mean, that's sort of out of my wheelhouse, and that's like the transfusion medicine but it's so important yeah. with what you're doing, the supply. You know, so you don't know anything about any government, anything? Dead in the water on that. Mm -hmm. I just, okay, yeah. Thank you. Yeah. So I'm going to ask you that. Thank you. Yeah. It's important. Yeah, but that's, I mean, talking about things that you can do, like, please don't blood when you can. <laughs> okay, uh, just let me 
Yeah. Trying to wrap it up. Um, anybody for their first time around, I'm going to do a, a quick second round, a couple more questions, and then we're going to wrap up. A million questions. <laughs> for, okay, well, I'm going to ask you a question, and I have to do a public service announcement in the beginning a little bit. Everybody throws the Second Amendment around. And it has some kind of individual right to own a weapon. It's not. It was intended by the founders to raise militias to, to fight the government. Um, and this myth came from the Supreme Court um, in modern times. And yeah, I think the Heller decision was the Heller decision, decision. Yeah. exactly. So we got to work on our Supreme Court. So we got to do to help your problem. That's my public service answer. Prisons is my question. Do you go to prisons because the recidivism of the prisoners? They're mostly guys that are there because they're women, because they shotguns and stuff. Do you go to prison? Yeah, so I, I mean, I don't personally because I'm a doctor, but our partners in the criminal justice system do, and they do do a lot of reentry work. Actually, the, the highest risk time for injury recidivism is the time when somebody leaves prison. Right after you leave prison is an incredibly dangerous time in people's lives um, because they're like unprotected for the first time. And so if they were involved in some sort of social network that created a problem for them, they would then um, have, you know, when at that time when they're out of jail and they're like available to be shot, they're really likely to become a victim. So I, I would say our folks in the criminal justice world are doing a lot of work in reentry. Um, and I think that that's, you know, a fair point and is really important. Well, thank you so much, Dr. Yeah, Brian. Of